Good morning and welcome back to Speech YouTube. Today we're going to go over our week four games of CDS Season 2 against Grand Pro Roji. Uh, these are our champions, as I've said maybe three or four times now. Uh, I've got Gwen, Leona, Draven, Nila, Ken, and Lucian, Sejuani, Kaisa, Gangplank, the Porra King. And the Extrusive Elementals, aka Grand Pro Roji, is on Varus, Akshan, Pantheon, Talia, Fiora, Ziggs, Garen, Bard, Malphite, and Zareth. If you know who Grand Pro Roji is, famous world's person, famous world's man, man from worlds. Uh, he's also a famous player of big midrange, and so if you look at what Ruji will bring, it's very clear what Ruji will bring, right? He's going to bring either Varus Akshan, or Varus Pantheon, or Akshan Pantheon, or Akshan Garen, or Pantheon Fiora, or Talia Ziggs, or Talia Malphite, or Fiora Bard, or Fiora Garen, or Zig Zareth, or Garen Bard, right? Like, these are all that Ruji really has, right? And if you look at his regions, he's only got four. He's only got, uh, Demacia, Shreema, Bandle if you include Ziggs, um and Targon, and then like three Runeterrans or something. Or t yeah, no, two Runeterrans. And that's not many regions. Uh, and if you know Roji, right? Like Roji is sort of like Rigorex in as much as like he has an archetype that he embellishes. And so when prepping for him, you're going to expect these decks. Um, there's going to be landmark theme midrange, weapon theme midrange, but in general, they're just the biggest versions of midrange that you'll find. In week one against Shardox, he brought Varus Akshon for your Pantheon and Ziggs Talia Malphite, just one Malphite. It should be two Ziggs, three Talia. Um, and he lost against Shardox. And against L Games, he did try to do something a little bit cute, which was Bard, Garen, and then a double Cosmic Call deck. But obviously, with Cosmic Call nerf, there's no way he'll bring it again. Um, and then in week three versus Jason Sational, he brought Varus Akshon to Liam Elphite and Zig Zara. Sort of like, uh, like the Arsenal deck, right? And then he lost that. But as you can see, like, you know, at the end of the day, all of these decks are vaguely similar, right? Or oh, there's some similarity between all of these, right? Bard, Garen, Varus Akshon, and Varus Akshon. You can build a lineup that can beat both Bard, Garen, and Varus Akshan, and you'll always be able to beat Roji, because that's how Roji functions, right? It's a bit sad that that's how Roji works, and sometimes Roji will be able to, like, beat you anyway, even if you target him. But Roji is archetypal in what he has brought with him. Uh, one thing I want to quickly mention before we go into a bit more of the, the specific strategy that we went to. Uh, Pink Ghost has been doing a lot of stuff regarding CDS content, right? Pink Ghost runs this tournament. And one thing that has been doing is these sort of pre-game shows with Icardo from last season, who came third. And I wanted to show you this clip from the... It says week five pre-game show. I'm pretty sure that's the week four pre-game show. Wait, the thumbnail says week three. The, the title says week five, but the answer is week four. I'm going to yell at Pink Ghost about this in a bit, but uh, I want to show you this clip just for a second. Oh, uh, for context, they're talking about... Um, what I should bring into Grandpa Roji's lineup. And they're talking about whether I should be bringing uh, a Gwen Nilla deck that's like Gwen Fizz. It's like an elusive deck. You know, you run the Vic Rash, you run elusive stuff, you run the guy that does a free attack again on one cost units. It's just, it's just Gwen Fizz, but instead of Fizz, it's Nilla. That's the context. They're saying maybe I should bring that this week. Yeah, it would definitely be, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. You know, I would suggest testing it. You know, if Spizz is listening, you know, don't just jam that shit. But I'm pretty <laughs> sure the Spizz, like, has played Gwen Fizz before. Oh yeah, um, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, that is not true. I've never played Gwiz. Gwiz. I've never played Gwen Fizz, aka Gwiz, before in my life. Um, in fact, if you uh, uh, ha excuse me, I've never imported a, a slides before. Ha uh, um, hold on, slideshow. How do I? Okay, thank you. I, I finally learned how to leave this page. So <laughs> okay, I don't think I'm ever doing that again. Um, if you look at my mastery, right, Gwen is my third highest mastery, and Fizz is nowhere fucking near. And I'm pretty sure most, if not all, of that Fizz should be Fizzillion Taskmaster, <laughs> I think. I'm pretty sure that's, like, a time has come Taskmaster deck, as far as I'm aware. Um, so I just, I find it really funny that they're both like, oh yeah, of course, of course, Fizz. I'm pretty sure she's played Gwen Fizz. I just, I think it's really funny when people tell lies on the internet, or assume that they know something. Um... I do recommend watching these pre-game shows. I think they're rather interesting, and it's very funny to look at back at them, like, ironically, to see what they suggest. And after watching this, if you watch that and you can see, like, how they talk about the matchup, it's very, very humorous. Uh, same with the other matchups, right? And there's also been a few other things that uh, Pinkos has been doing, such as interviews and deck dives and all these sorts of things with Prism Side. Um, so I recommend checking out some of that stuff. You know, do that now. Um, I also wanted to include this. This is... Uh, because I showed this mastery tab to show what my Fizz and my Gwen was like. Um, this is also just all my mastery in a spreadsheet, because fucking, I love spreadsheets. Uh, as a quick side note, I find it really funny that I've only got, uh, I've got no Mastery 5 Demacians outside of Vayne, and I've got four Mastery 5 Shurimans. 
yet like the most mastery overall is still in Demacia and Shurima's mastery is like the sixth most mastery. I just think that's humorous, um, percentage wise. Anyway, um, this is the table that we ended up working on. I worked on this with Hash a little bit, then I worked on it with Roma a little bit, I worked on it with, with uh, Jansport a little bit. And so we had four or five decks that were pretty, pretty Grimperodian, things that we actually had lists of, right? Unlike, for example, uh, Varus Pantheon, which he hadn't brought, so we don't know what his list would look like exactly. And his, Roji often brings very specific weird lists that he quite likes. Um, the obvious thing to go into something like Roji was Plunder or Red Gwen. They're very good anti mid range, but still powerful aggressive options, right? Plunder does really well to fill your Pantheon. You just Plunder lock them. It's just good enough. It works in okay into various action, bad guy, and although we never actually tested them, but I'm pretty sure it would be fine. But it can't be Talia Malphite. Talia Malphite, just like the 9-9 the nine nine from Salt Spire and the size of Malphite are literally too big for Plunder to actually get wins on, right? Like Plunder will never actually win against Talia Malphite. Which sounds a bit weird considering you're so used to thinking of just sedge locking as an instant win against mid-range decks, but it just doesn't work against Talia Malphite, very specifically. Red Gwen does pretty well into everything, so that was pretty much a lock. We just wanted to make sure that it actually did beat things. Uh, Elusive CS we tried, and it does beat Talia Malphite. Talia Malphite can only play one unit per turn, sometimes even half a unit per turn. So being able to just develop multiple units and then eventually play CS was a pretty favorable option, but Fiora Pantheon's able to just challenge and play for Fiora, genuinely. But playing for Fiora will beat that Elusive CS deck, and that's um that's the same deck uh, Sleepy and I worked on in week one. Doesn't really beat Ferris Auction for similar reasons, they just quicksand your units and you can't really win and they can play more than one unit a turn or they can match you on units rather easily um shell folk was another option but it, it does lose if the enemy gamer can even aggress a little bit so that wasn't really available uh then we tried leona ionia the logic for this was that ionia is really good into big dumb mid-range you always just recall malphite and then they have to spend all that mana on malphite again and you're gonna win the game and Leona is also pretty good into mid-range stuff. You just done them out and your units are bigger than theirs. So combining those into a Leona Ionia with like Kennen is quite a uh, interesting idea. And it worked out pretty well. Um, and we'll look at that list later because we do end up bringing it. We were going to lock in Plunder, Red Gwen, Leona Ionia the night before deck submission. And then uh, I, I we, we relearned that Plunder just can't beat Talia Malphite. So we went with the Pori King Sejuani. Which was interesting. I was expecting the Pro King not to really be good enough against these mid-range decks, but we found that just one Frosted Snacks like, is genuinely enough to, to beat a lot of what you need to do, and it can be... It just sort of gets there. It, it doesn't feel like something I can really explain in a, in, a, in, a, in a single bit, right? It feels like something that there should be like an obvious reason why. Like, Red Gwen obviously beats mid-range because they can't block quick attack the units are too strong they do have to block them eventually but not favorably and then you do reckoners or you do harrowing and you win the game right that seems really obvious with the pro king sejuani like what am i gonna say your your units are big their units are smaller that doesn't sound right but it ends up you end up just getting there timing wise it's very weird um so that's what we ended up bringing and we thought that if they're gonna bring a, a zigs deck or a bandle city deck it has to be banned uh, the logic was that I can't really beat Zarathy stuff. Zarathy stuff would beat Red Gwen. Zarathy stuff would probably beat, like, Pori King Sejuani. Um, I just, I can't really deal with things like double Pokey Stick or Drop the Bomb or these sorts of cards. So, if they brought Zig Zarath to Leah, something along those lines, I would just have to ban it. If they don't bring it, then it seems like the next best ban would probably be Varus Akshan, maybe Varus Pantheon, but that, that's a long way we were going. All right. That's all cool and all, but ignore all of that. He brought double Cosmic Call. Um, and I actually I actually don't think it's that bad. When I told people that Roji ended up bringing double Cosmic Call, everyone was like, did he not know that it was nerfed? How, why did he bring it? But I actually think it's a really good option against me. I think it's really clever that he brought double Cosmic Call. Uh, so, like, let's go through the logic. You've got Roji and you've got me, right? Roji will play his dumb Roji piles, right? His Talia Malphites, his Varus Akshans or whatever. So I'll counter those. I will play my Sejuanis or my Leonas or my Poro Kings, which will be bigger or be able to stun or freeze and like out mid-range the mid-range by getting rid of their key units via like efficient combat tricks, like freezes. So I will do that. And then Roji can come back to me and say, okay, Spids is playing Leona, Sejuani or the Poro King. I'll counter that. And to counter a deck like Sejuani or Leona that doesn't have burn, it doesn't have over the top, it doesn't have overwhelm outside of like, you know, Sejuani herself. 
Uh, I can't rally unless I bring Lucian, and I only can bring one Lucian, right? Like, if he... He can kill Draven, right? That's the Overwhelm and Burn deck. He can kill Lucian. And by kill, I mean let up or burn. Uh, let up or ban, which has rally. Then all of my other regions. Targon, Ionia, Vandal City, Shadow Isles, Shurima, Poro King region. None of them are going to have burn. None of them are going to have overwhelm. None of them are going to have rallies. None of them are going to have a way for me to deal with... Um, the fact that Cosmic Call only loses one turn out of like the attack token and defense turn cycle, right? So all Roji needs to do is play Cosmic Call after I attack on a turn five or a turn six or maybe a turn seven. Then on their attack token, just play nonsense like Trifecta or Solari Priestess and win the game. And I don't have answers for that because the low tempo that Cosmic Call now has as like an eight mana do nothing doesn't matter if I can't capitalize on a lack of tempo. And with like, anti-midrange midrange decks, I'm not really trying to capitalize on tempo, I'm just trying to be bigger than them constantly. And so, these sort of, like, combo decks that are able to create even bigger units or destroy my units efficiently, such as a Invex deck, would actually do pretty well into me. I think bringing double Cosmic Call was a genuine, like, rather clever strategy from Roji. Let's go over the deck lists. Uh, this is Fury Pantheon, this is Bard Malphite. These are two of the Cosmic Call lists, so they're about the same. Uh... Despite what I just said about bringing Cosmic Call as a really good idea, uh, I don't like this deck list. And I know I ridiculed L Games' deck list as well for the, the triple mistrates. Um, I think if you're going to bring the same deck three times, you better make sure that your, like, your 34 cards that aren't champions are really, really, really good. And last time L Games, I think, fucked up by not having Mark of the Isles and not having Boisterous Host. And I think Rampo Roji did a very similar mistake. I don't know why he's on Starlet Epiphany. I get that it says Invoke, and it puts more Invokes into your deck, so Pog Invoke. But I feel like Moon Dreamer is better as a blocker. I feel like, you know, Sunburst is really important for killing things like the Poro King if you don't get uh, a, an Obliterate from Solari Priestess or Mountain Scryer. I'm surprised to not see the other, the seven mana heal destroy. That would have made me better than Starlet Epiphany, in my opinion. Uh, I'm surprised I didn't see Falling Star. I'm really surprised not to see Solari Sunhawk, which seems like an insanely important card, or even Solari uh, Sunforger for healing, right? If he thinks I'm going to bring, like, aggro slanted midrange, then you could bring Solari Sunforger. If you think I'm going to bring control midrange, then he should really be on Sunhawk. He should be at least on one of those, and I'm really surprised not. Star Tip Peak looks like it costs one mana here. It does cost two. I don't hate Star Tipped Peak, but it's not great. It's just sort of okay. I get why, but I think you should be cutting some of these fluffy cards like Solid Epiphany and Star Tip Peak for other things. I get Lunari Dustbringer, but it doesn't seem amazing to me. It doesn't actually buff anything with the the token. And it, while it's an early blocker, I don't know, Sunhawk is better, right? Even Solari Soldier is better, right? I don't know. I, I don't think this was a bad idea, but I really don't like how this list is built. I... I and maybe, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe he scrimmed this incessantly, and this is just the most, you know, the the best way of doing this. But it's very, very, for for a for an invoke deck, I don't think you should be BBG pilled and do a bunch of three ofs and two two ofs or one three of and one one of. I really think this should be a little bit more granular in its in its uh, ratioing. This is the final deck you brought, Zig Zareth. This ended up being the ban, so we're not going to talk about it too much. I want to explain why it's the ban a little. I just think that like with all of my decks, if they can set up a Zareth. And a 5-5 five, five, and then just hold Rite of Negation or, sorry, Rite of, Rite of the Arcane, Quicksand or Hourglass up. I just can't win, really. They'll sort of block the board. Um, getting a 5-5 five, five really early or even an Endless Devout procking is really, really good for them. And Rock Hopper is weird in as much as, like, my big midrange struggles when the enemy gamer has, like, efficient units on the ratio of mana to strength. As opposed to, like, mana to health and strength. Right, the fact that Rockhopper has a three drop worth of attack and an effect with health that is, it doesn't matter what health he has because it's always going to block into me, it's just quite scary, right? Like, what if Rockhopper is able to kill all of my three health units that will be in any of my decks, whether it's a buffed up Poro, whether it's a one of my Jagged Butchers or something, right? Stuff that I have to put effort into. Uh, it's just co constant trades like that I can't deal with. And Xerath and Quicksand and Rider right the Arcane are just going to do quite well into me. All right, these are my decks. The first one is Red Gwen. You shouldn't be too surprised. It's a little bit different from last week. Again, we're back on Disintegrate because Roji's on dumb, stupid midrange is what we thought he was going to be. 
And that's about it. There's no vile piece because it doesn't do anything into dumb stupid mid range, which is what we all thought he was going to be on. Absent of that, it's pretty equidistant. It's just Red Gwen. He ends up banning it, so we're not going to talk about it too much. And I think it makes sense to ban it, considering my other decks, which are Pora King, Sejuani, and Ken and Leona, are less aggressive, which means that the Cosmic Call deck will be able to deal with them much more efficiently. Next is Pora King, Sejuani. We got rid of Ice Shard, and we're now on, you know, three Sisters and Harsh Winds and Buried in Ice, because again, we're trying to be big, dumb midrange. And Harsh Winds and three Sisters aren't great into Invoke. You might think they do okay because they can kill a Great Beyond or, or prevent a, a Phoenix on the turn they're going to kill you, but you have to spend two of them to do that on that turn. And with the way the Cosmic Call deck plays, and I guess I didn't talk about that really enough, um, the ideal turn sequence for the Cosmic Call deck is Float, Float, Turn 3 Solari Priestess, turn 4 Mountain Scryer, have all your banked mana plus 5 mana for Cosmic Call, and then the turn after that you do Sisters. And I can't really effectively deal 20 damage through both Priestess and Scryer on turn 5. Right, my decks aren't aggressive enough to do that. Which means if they can get Priestess plus Scryer plus Cosmic Call, they will have two invoked cards and a Cosmic Call played on turn 6, which means they will be able to develop a couple of units. Combine that with something like a Celestial Trifecta or a Star Shaping or a Star Tip Peak that may have procced earlier, although keep in mind that that means they can't do the Cosmic Call unless they don't want to play Precess or something. Uh, it just... It just fucks things up, right? Uh, so... I don't know. I think that, like, this deck does have really good curves. And that sort of curve can beat Poro King Search 1. If they don't have that sort of curve, I could definitely be more aggressive with this deck. We saw Poro King Search 1 last week. I don't think it's too... Why do we have to go over it too much depth? I do want to say, sorry, we're on two Poro Cannon. Uh, keep in mind, we're trying to beat uh, dumb midrange. And a good way of beating, like, Talia Malphite is having, like, three Daring Poros. So a Daring Poro and a Poro Cannon, and just buffing them with Poro Snacks. So, like, that's why this Poro Cannon. This list would have been really cool to play if we were actually fighting midrange. Finally, we have Kennen Leona, which is just Ionia Leona. Uh, this deck will look a little bit weird, but it's just mono Leona. Except Vestine Disciple fucks up Roji because he can't interact with it. He's not on Vile Feast, he's not on Pokey Stick, he can't kill Vestine Disciple. Portal Pioneer destroys landmarks and weapons, which would in theory beat everything that he was bringing. Twin Disciplines is really, really good defensively. I'm just like, imagine if they Furious Wielder, a Sun Guardian, and then you Twin Disciplines and it stays alive, right? Twin Disciplines is just phenomenal. It's part of the reason why I went into Ionia. Deny is quite good. I can deny Malphite's Ground Slam and win on the next turn. And there's just a few other things Deny does. It beats Furious Builder. And Unworthy Soul is just beautiful, right? Like, it counters Malphite. It counters Talia. It, it prevents us from dying and destroys weapons and destroys landmarks. Well, bounces landmarks so they don't pop off. Uh, very cool deck. Very specifically trying to beat the stuff that Roji didn't bring. Uh, but that's everything I want to talk about before the games. Uh... The the games, we're going to go over them instead of, you know, there's a few formats that I use for doing the VOD reviews. Uh, I'm going to play the game each match in full and then talk about the match afterwards, um, mostly because I think my in-game commentary for the matches are pretty sufficient for what they need to be. I think I talk about the logic quite consistently, and I think watching his Cosmic Call deck work in turn will show you that I, I really don't think that Cosmic Call was that bad of a bring. I think if you see how he structures his turn 3, his turn 4, his turn 5, his turn 6, you'll see that Cosmic Call was not that bad at all. Okay, that's all I wanted to talk about. I will see you next week. Goodbye. Try not to die. Alright, we're about to fight Roji. Instead of bringing what I wanted him to bring, he brought double Cosmic Call, which is twice as many Cosmic Calls as I wanted him to bring. But that's, that's okay. We're, we're gonna lose, but that's fine. Uh, losing is part of winning. Well, here's Leona Ionia. Here's Gwen, comma, Red. Here's Poro King, comma, Sejuani. Comma, the. I'm gonna ban Zig Zareth. We're gonna try and beat Cosmic Call. Hopefully, hopefully they brick, or hopefully the fact that they have to play eight mana to play Cosmic Call gives me a little bit of tempo. Obviously, if they've got, you know, cards to combine with their Cosmic Call, it'll be difficult, but hopefully they're too slow to be able to organize that properly. I don't expect to win. I'm not necessarily in the best state to win. But... Whatever. Okay, goodbye Zig Zareth. They're gonna ban Red Gwen. I don't think they're allowed to not ban Red Gwen. Yep. 
All right, let's start with Poro King Sichuani with all of our harsh winds and three sisters that we brought. Uh, actually, you know what? I think we should have started with this because they're. Ah, never mind. Oh, they're going to start with Fear of Pantheon. Uh, okay. Poro King Sichuani into Bard Malphite. Okay. I like going wide. Going wide is cool. I'm a big fan of going wide. I don't know if Patty Poro or Affectionate Poro are better than just Poro Herder. But I think a one drop into a two drop, hopefully into some better stuff later on, is very nice. Two Poro Herders, like, Poro Herders really good into them early on. They're not on Sunburst. Wait a minute, they're not on Sunburst. They can't kill. Why aren't they on Sunburst? Did they forget? Where is your Sunburst? I guess they're, like, relying on. On the woman that holds the spear above her head, Solari Priestess, to kill me. But they forego Sunburst. I think that's a massive oversight. Sunburst is like the main card, I think. Yeah, like sure, they play Solari Priestess, but they forego Sunburst. Are they on Pale? They are on Pale. Okay, then I'm willing to play Lonely Power. They, if they want a positive block lonely power, my hand is good enough that I think I'm allowed to accept that. Yeah, that's okay. I think we're just going to do affectionate into sled into snacks, probably. Oh my god. Mountain Scryer. Okay, they can play sisters next turn, so maybe we should just open. I don't hate opening, actually. I mean, I do hate opening into Cosmic Call. I think I'd rather play this. I understand that if they've got Sisters, it becomes a little bit weird. Because Sisters does block well into me. They could also have obliterate everything that's small and tiny in the world. But I really didn't want them to play Cosmic Fall. Like, if I attack them and they take the damage and then play Cosmic Call, they're going to feel fine. Like, I need to pressure their mana so that they can't feel comfortable playing Cosmic Call. Because Cosmic Call into, I don't know, a Celestial Trifecta or whatever they got off these two is probably good enough to win them back their tempo. Or at least threaten stuff like the Warrior that allows them to kill the Pyro King. They're definitely a thinking. Sisters. Cool. That's sort of what I was expecting, so I'm not too surprised by sisters. I could pull Golden to the side. That way Golden... I actually kind of like that. That way Golden has two health. Um, which means that she won't be... Um, she won't be able to attack into Poro Herder effectively. I think I like that more. It's a little bit weird, but I think it's the right play. I'll we'll have to see what they do next turn. So they got this off Scryer, which means they still have the card from the woman who holds a spear above her head. Okay, that that's really sad. Okay, if I play the Poro King and they've got Obliterate from the woman that... Like, they should probably take Obliterate from the woman that holds the spear above her head. Oh, not Obliterate, sorry, like the... I mean, I guess it's an Obliterate. The, the, the one that's like Sunburst, which means the Poro King is not surviving. Because they've got two Mountain Scryers. This means that I think I should play Lonely Poro despite that and try and get the special snacks and just let Poro King die. Um, I'm gonna play Hatched Poro Bot. I think next turn I am gonna play the Poro King and just get the special snacks. Seems pretty decent to me. Like, just as a 5 mana access special snacks, right? I don't hate it. Are they going to play Cosmic Call for 2 mana? I don't hate that. If 
If they have obliterate everything that's cheap in the world, I could see that being really sad for me. I am still going to play the Poro King. I think I'm willing to risk him having obliterate everyone that's cheap. Because my attack is still very, very good. And if they've got just kill Poro King, if they've got, they could have kill two units. I'm not too upset at kill two units. They'd kill, um, Sled and Poro King, but I'm, I'll live with that, I think. My attack is good enough, I hope. With colorful plus Poro Fly. So they've got one expensive and one medium. Okay, expensive Cosmic Call. Yeah, so they could still do Obliterate, and that's what they're planning on doing. They have a ch they have an expensive off thing, which should cost, what, like five mana roundabout? And they should have the cheap thing, which should be something they can afford, because it should be four halved into two. Don't tell me they're thinking about shooting sled. No, it is falling, okay. Okay, here's Colorful Snacks, let's get Spell Shield. Impact, okay. And let's just open. In theory, I think I should put sled last. I think it should probably be like this. Okay, now they're not dead here. They'll probably survive. I'm hoping they're going to lose a lot of their units. Yeah, okay. I mean, you can keep a uh, Mountain Scryer alive. Yeah. Now, I'm hoping an expensive... Hoping one expensive invoke is not enough to win the game, right? Even if they have the Scourge, I don't think it's going to be enough to kill me. Is my hope, and neither will Great Beyond. So I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get another attack in. Now they could have Celestial Trifecta and sort of flood the board, which could definitely imbue some fear into me. So know that one of their cards in hand is Bard. We do have Double Freeze. Like, they can't really beat our open attacks. They don't have interaction outside of Targon Tailstones. So, like, we can also just try and flood the board go wide if they can't flood the board themselves. Or if they can't threaten lethal. Like, I'm trying to figure out what, what, uh, what like, invoked hand states could they have that are scary for us. And I don't think there are very many. Bard's very good for us. Uh, could they afford Living Legends? It would go to 8 and then be halved down. They could afford Living Legends. I think I'm just going to play Poro Fly. Okay, they've got Living Legends. Alright, how much winning are they doing? Okay, Cosmic Inspire. If it's just Cosmic Inspire, I'm going to pass afterwards. I still believe that I might have to double three sisters a big elusive unit. Will it ever be big enough for me to be scared of it? I don't think the answer to that question is yes. They shouldn't have anything else invoked. Serpent, okay. How big is their big elusive unit going to be? Unless they have multiple. If they have multiple and they both have spell shield, I could be in a tizzy. I'm willing to pass again. Warrior. I'm willing to pass again. Okay. They probably have obliterates in hand. Mm. Am I doing Poro King? 
What if they've got obliterates? If I do Poro stories, there's a good chance I can just go wide enough, right? And if they do... Yeah, I think I like that. I think I'm supposed to do Poro stories and not Poro King. I think I'm willing to posit that I'm going to try and go wide enough and kill them that way. Sisters. Well, there goes going wide enough. Sister sort of prevents that. I can still freeze one and three sisters the other. Do they have obliterate all? I can't beat that, so I'm not going to bother playing around it. Starlet. Okay. So look, provided they don't have like two targ on Telstones, right? And they could have two targ on Telstones. My plan is to entomb Golden Sister and Fury of the North another unit. Or maybe Flash Freeze Golden Sister. How much mana do I have? I've got 11. 11 is enough for 5 plus 6. I could do entomb if it so behooves me. Okay. That makes things a lot worse. All right. That means I'm sort of behoven to develop a unit. No, I can entomb in front of Pouty Poro. It just means I'm no longer beating Targon Tailstones. But I think that's the line, right? Because developing a unit is just going to be responded to by their develop. Snacks doesn't change anything, as far as I can tell. If I play the Pora King, I am one wider. But without Overwhelm, it doesn't really matter. I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure the line is that we're entombing the six mana and either flash freezing or fury than all thing for else i mean if we attack with pouty poro first we do get to do the entomb to begin with it just they, they just freeze the pouty poro and we're dead right that's the that's the main issue is it worth attacking with everything surely the best line is literally just to attack with pouty poro and do the double three sisters and if that doesn't get me there then I'll just, like, cry. I don't know. I think this is technically right. Just to attack with the Paddy Poro. I think this is what we're doing. Do you have Targon Tailstones? They have Targon Tailstones. Okay. Now we gotta hope we don't lose. That's that's our position at the moment. Okay. Mm-hmm. Look, this game's probably theirs. I think it's very unlikely that I'm able to win. <sighs> which is which is not too surprising. I think this deck is very much like you know, Cosmic Call is very much trying to be able to beat the Borrow King. Okay. Is our out harsh wins? I need to find. Let me open up LR Master Trap. So, if their plan is to open, we will need to find harsh wins. We could play Poro King and try and find the freeze thing if they develop, but I think if I play Poro King, they're never going to develop. 
So as far as I'm aware, I'm pretty sure the play is to pass and threaten harsh winds on the three sisters on the on that unit. Okay. Now they've got wide people happy lethal. Which still loses to the same thing, so I'm supposed to pass. Then I can freeze sisters. Okay. Provided this whatever elusive unit or overwhelm unit they have doesn't have spell shield, I can not. There's a world in which I don't die this turn. Um. Okay, I think I'm supposed to sky splitter. They could still have like another thing that they invoke that goes for lethal, but. I kind of want to win via three sisters, right? Like, I think that's how I win the video game. So I'm pretty sure this is right. Okay. Well, here's hoping they brick. Okay, now that's game. I'm finally willing to show them the GG. If you play one more unit, I'm surrendering. I am surrendering. I do not care for you, Grandpa Roji. I I'm trying to play video games here. I don't want to stop. I don't want to be doing nothing. All right, you've just seen game one. It was rather long, so I really hope you watched it at a quicker speed. But I think it's really important to see uh, a couple of things, especially regarding how I interact with the game, which is something that I don't think is really touched on too, too much uh, in normal Spids YouTube mod reviews, but uh, I think seeing that in turn is quite useful for identifying some of the play patterns that are changing. Now, with CDS, you submit decks 15 minutes before the decks go live. Compare that to Aegis, where you have about a day to practice against specific deck lists. And that's quite relevant for some of the misplays I'm about to identify purely come down or, or are better explained via specific play patterns that I was not privy to ahead of time. Now, if I was like mega ultra brained, I could figure these out ahead of time just by looking at the deck list. I am not at that level yet. So I want to talk about those a little bit, but let's go through the game sequentially. This mulligan, I am pretty satisfied with. I think that these units, uh, ooh, that's not the pen. This unit and this unit are relatively dull and Poro Herder, I do think as one copy, maybe not three, is valuable against a deck that does not have good Poro Herder blockers after, before turn four, right? And we do have one attack token for turn two and then one on turn four, sorry, uh, but one on turn uh, three and possibly on turn five. So like we do get something, we get to at least attack with this on three, which I think is quite valuable. Uh, Poro Bot might be better, but I don't hate keeping Poro Herder. Also lets us find Poro King and all these sorts of things. First couple of turns I don't really hate, but turn three is the first turn that I dislike. So this one one, I justify within my in-game commentary by saying they could have Pale Cascade, which would allow this block, let's press the H key so that goes away. Um, that allows this block to be favorable for the enemy gamer and they get to keep three health on this unit, provided they've got Pale Cascade. So my logic is this one one pushes in two damage or gets a positive trade and lets us keep this around, right? So either this is plus one damage for free or it's plus two damage at the cost of a unit, but I'm able to develop board a lot wider. I don't think this is bad logic against any other deck that's running this, but not Cosmic Call. Uh, maybe like against a Leona deck, you might have some issues with it, but I, I quite like this play into most decks. But against this deck, I think it is a misplay. And the reason why is entirely based on their turn five and turn six. So their ideal next turn is like Mountain Scryer, right? That costs four mana, which means they're banking three and going into turn five with the fifth piece of mana. They do not want to spend any mana over the next two turns besides Mountain Scryer 
and and Cosmic Call. If if possible, I will force them not to play Cosmic Call on turn five via pressuring them with the with the mana thing I was talking about within the in-game commentary, right? If I develop on turn five, they may not be able to justify Cosmic Call without taking too much damage that they're not able to take, which means they have to develop units, which means their Cosmic Call is even further delayed because I might have to do it on turn six, and then I get to develop an open attack, or they have to do it on turn seven after I attack, and that becomes much slower, and I'm hopefully able to win the game after that, right? It's all about pressuring their mana and not letting them ever feel unantsy. If I force them to do Pale Cascade and block like this, they don't have this two mana, which means they spend four mana next turn on the on the Mountain Scryer, and then they do not have five mana for Cosmic Call, which means that I am either able to open attack if I want or develop a little bit more aggressively. If they spend five mana again on something like a Sisters, that means they only have six plus one on turn six. All of this is really, really good for me. So forcing them to play Pale Cascade is a lot better. Now, obviously, if I don't attack with the 1-1, I'm not forcing them to play Pale Cascade, but the logic for attacking with the 1-1 is so much worse if Pale Cascade is a good thing for me to see than a bad thing for me to see. Playing the 1-1 and attacking with it is saying, I think you playing Pale Cascade would be a bad thing for me, so I want to make it so that your Pale Cascade is worse, right? Because I'm pushing in one extra damage. Pug. One extra damage. Hell yeah, I'm winning the video game off of it. But them playing Pale Cascade is amazing for me. So attacking with these and sort of baiting them into Pale Cascade would be an absolutely phenomenal position. There's a few notes about this. This necessarily implies that we think they want to do Mountain Scryer. There are worlds in which they don't have Mountain Scryer and thus the two mana difference from Pale Cascade is like subverted by them just playing Lunari, Duskbringer and Spacey Sketcher. Which is fine, it gets them two blockers and they can still do the thing next turn. But their turns become a lot worse when they don't have the passive value of Mountain Scry, which you'll see over the course of these games is something that Grandpa Rochi quite values a lot, this passive value of Mountain Scry, being able to discount things. So, look, I... At the time, I really liked this play. Had I done a little bit more scrimming and realized exactly what turn order Grandpa Rochi was desperate for, I think attacking with this 1-1 or even just playing it in general would have been a misplay. That's the first thing. We can continue moving on and playing these units. At this time, I still haven't realized that they want to do Cosmic Call on 5, which means that I haven't really thought about what turns I want to go through yet, right? Like, next turn, am I developing Poro Sled? It gets answered by the 5 mana, 5 because of this unit, uh, Obliterate, and it also sort of gets answered by Sisters, but Sisters slows them down. I haven't really decided if that's what I want to do yet, so at the time, I, I'm just thinking, well, I want to open attack, right? That way I'm dealing the most damage, and I'm not losing to sisters. I'm only, I haven't thought about Cosmic Call yet. I think if I had been a little bit more aware and critical, I would have just played Affectionate Poro into this and held up uh, Poro Snacks. That way, a lot of my attacks look a lot better into the things they want to do. Alternatively, if we end up just going to what the next turn looks like, um, I think there's worlds in which you just like open here and you sort of accept that they might do Cosmic Call and then open pass if they pass back on your turn six or if they develop a unit, they have to literally have uh, like both an Obliterate and Sisters off these two, which they ended up having um, for us to not want to play the Poro King. I think this is where the turns get a little bit more complicated and sad for me, but I don't hate the Poro Slate, it does pressure a lot. This attack with their units is a little bit weird. Uh, normally, I think it's pulling this feels fine because this is like a very obvious positive trade. But I think like looking at the two options, right, of where you pull. If you pull this unit, this is blocking here, this is probably blocking here, and then this can either block here or here. I think that's a little bit worse compared to letting us maintain health on this unit. It, it Maybe that's not correct. Maybe maintaining health on this unit is not relevant at all. But at the time, I was concerned. But maybe, maybe pulling this is better. I'm uncertain. You're basically arguing whether you want a Poro Herder to stay alive because it's going to be blocked by two strength or nothing. Or if you want to like maintain health on the Poro Slayer, I think. But it's not a particularly... I don't think this turn matters too much in the grand scheme of the game. Uh, yeah. They miss allegiance. 
And at this point, I decide not to play the Pora King because I'm scared of the Obliterate, which they do have in hand, and it costs enough mana that they can play it. So I decide to go wide and then play the Pora King next turn. I think my in-game commentary is pretty astute for this. I, I didn't remember that I had played this Poro already. And I think had I realized that, I would have first played the Poro this guy. That way I can keep up this mana. Because I end up overriding a unit, right? So this is like a slight misplay. I forgot that I had already played a Jubilant and all only Poro prior in the game. So I wish I just played this. That way I can save one extra mana. And I can always play this next turn, right? It's not going to... The actions aren't going to matter too, too much. Anyway... I play snacks, then I override a unit, which I wouldn't have had to do. I would have been able not to have to do that prior. But it shouldn't matter too much regarding how this open attack works. Although, I guess in the event that I have an extra unit, I'm not attacking with the 2-2, which is quite nice. Uh, if you listen to his commentary, by the way, Grandpa Rogis, because he live streams this. Uh, you can see that both of us talk about spell shield at the same time. I think that's kind of humorous. We attack in, but it would have been better had we had just a regular, like, uh, Poro guy, Poro herder or whatever here. Um, that way we can use this unit as a blocker if we need to, the the daring Poro. We attack in. I don't think it's too concerning or stressful of an attack. I mean, the other thing is we could also, like, threaten Sky Splitter, right? If we had that extra one mana, maybe threaten killing this guy. Anyway, attack goes through... We get around to this turn, they play Living Legends. Now, one thing we should keep in mind with Living Legends is that they've only got four Living Legends cards, which are these four. And so you can sort of count them and work out what they're doing, right? If you've been keeping track of the hand, they have nothing else invoked. And if you look at his hand, I'm pretty sure it's Malphite, Bard, Targon Tellstones, and then two other clunkers that no one really cares about. Maybe Starlet Epiphany. Um, anyway, he plays this. That's two cards he's done, the, the buff spell and, and serpent. Then he does the warrior. And at this point, I should be able to realize that he only has one card left in hand. Now, this could be an obliterate or it could be sisters. And that's sort of the dichotomy we're set with regarding Poro King. If it's sisters, I want to play Poro King so I can get a special snacks. Whether that snacks is frostbite snacks or colorful snacks or pepper snacks or challenger snacks, which I think is like a coffee, espresso snacks. Um, that would be great. But if they have an Obliterate, I really don't want to play the Poro King. I'd rather play the Poro King next turn and hope that they don't have an Invoke and find the Obliterate off just the Invoke, which would be maybe harder. Or maybe maybe it's equal, actually. Probably is equal. This attack is really interesting. I, I, I didn't really consider blocking because I thought I need to go wide to threaten my lethal. And I didn't want to lose to Pale Cascade. But threatening this unit and forcing them to spend mana isn't that awful. And I think if I had done that, I would have been in a slightly better position. For either they have to spend mana to protect it, or they're not getting mana from like the, the invokes that they've got in their deck. And their deck is nothing but invokes, right? So I don't think that this block would have been too bad, but I decide not to go for it as you in the in-game commentary. And then at this point, I decide that if they have an Obliterate, Poro stories plus three sisters will be enough to win. That's what I decide. Now, that's not true, but that's what I decide in the in-game commentary. So I decide to play for that sort of line. Unfortunately, their last card out of all of the things they could have gotten from uh, the, the Living Legends is this. At this point, I think I wish I had played Poro King. I hadn't realized that they had no more uh, invoked cards. Wait, I do play Poro King, right? No, 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 no. I go wide. They, but... At this point, I wish I'd played Poro King to try and beat... Because they don't have any Obliterate cards, so the only way they can get an Obliterate card is to Invoke for it. And I think playing Poro King would have been fine in that position. It, obviously, they end up getting the Obliterate from the, the, the Starlit Epiphany, but I think it's still the right play to go for it. Uh, only because that, I think, gives us the most outs in general. Into a board that looks like this. It's better than trying to hope they don't have Targon Tailstones. Or, what I don't realize is in their deck at the moment, Star Shaping. And my lines were never beating Star Shaping, and I never thought about Star Shaping at the time because I hadn't been used to fighting these decks yet. We go wide, they obliterate something. I think they obliterate the wrong unit. They should probably have obliterated the Patty Poro, but after this, the turns don't really matter. My in game commentary, I think it does a really good job of explaining how I wanted to beat their possible hands, right? Trying to find Harsh Wind so I can beat the Moon Glowed unit or maybe trying to top deck a daring poro which i didn't say but i think that would have also been just as good then them going wide and the sejuani saving us but not long enough i think that's fine i i mostly just wanted to use this game to explore a few things one i think that the early turn with the 
with the Pale Cascade was really interesting to think about in retrospect, having realized how much they need to play with their mana. Grandpa Roji's deck is really complicated with playing into it for their mana reasons, and I think there was a lot more criticality I could have given towards that sort of line of thinking. I think that I didn't play too, too awfully outside of that, besides minor... Uh, timing plays regarding my poros and like leveling up the poro king and this sort of stuff and that's something that is consistent over the next two games as you'll see or the, the other game that i played with the poro king but yeah that's that's all i wanted to share with this game i think we're going to do the same thing where i show you the next game in full and then talk about it later i don't know if i'm going to do that for the third game but i think it's good to watch the second game in sequence as well uh yep yeah, that that's all i'll I'll see you in a bit. Make sure you watch it double speed because it'll probably save you time. What would do better into Cosmic Call? A deck with no pressure or a deck with no pressure? Mm. And this is like, by and large, their better deck. Let's go with the Leona. I think Leona probably applies slightly more pressure if I roll well. But I presume this is game. I don't want these cards. I understand why Sunburst, but I really want early units. Yeah, this is better. I'm really surprised to see them on no no Sunburst, though. Do I wait till next turn to do Slurry Soldier? I don't hate that. I don't hate waiting till next turn to do Slurry Soldier. Oh, the Shimon Wind. Whoosh. Shimon Wind Whoosh is actually going to be really good against this, I think. Here is the Shimon Wind. Whoosh. Okay. Yep. I could have twinned and killed the youngling. But no, it said I played the Shimon Wind Whoosh. Here's Sun Guardian. Oh, Cosmic Youngling. Okay, well, maybe I'm not going to win, actually. I don't think Cosmic Youngling's like the be-all, end-all of I'm losing the video game. But this doesn't feel great for me. Uh, here's the Shimon Wind. Whoosh. And then I am going to attack. Now, do I aggro twin? Why would I have a defense twin? I think I'm willing to aggro... Oh, but I mean, like, I'm not even... Like, they're still gonna... I think... I think I'm supposed to aggro twin. It's weird, but I think it's right. Until they, you know, hush me. I mean, I really do need stuns. Maybe I should have... Did I did I mulligan away Sunhawk? I may have mulliganed away Sunhawk when I should have kept it. Just really wanted Sun Guardian. They're not on Falling Star either, which is very humorous to me. Priestess? Are they going to play Cosmic Call next turn? Am I... Am I dead? Yeah, okay, I'm dead. Oh well. Mm -hmm. I had a good run. Obliterate Ravoon or, or Sun Guardian. Mountain Scryer. Mm -hmm.
I think I'm gonna play Kennen. Uh, Kennen pops Spell Shield, and I don't think that's irrelevant. They would have had to find Living Legends off this. I'm willing I'm willing to risk that for the extra damage that Kennen provides. Like either they're blocking Kennen, which means they're not blocking some of this stuff, or Kennen gets two extra damage in. Uh oh, do they really have living legends? Oh man. Okay. Does it matter? If I top deck a cannon, I guess I'll want to have this guy be threatened. Do they have living legends? I am going to attempt to stun this. So they shouldn't have any other... They shouldn't have any other allegiance. They shouldn't have any other things they've invoked, right? They would have to play an invoke spell in order to invoke something else. Which is fine. Like, they can play an invoke spell and kill Leona or something. That's far from impossible. I wonder if I'm supposed to start Sunburst. That way I can destroy two units. Like, if I start Ravoon and they have predicted to double Obliterate, I might lose. While if I do Sunburst and they do double Obliterate, I might win. So I think I'm supposed to start Sunburst. And if they don't kill Leona, I have Morning Light, which I quite like. Keep in mind, I've also got Blessing of Targon for open attack lethals. Depending on what they do. I could have played Solari Soldier. You don't have to start with Dayman. You can always start with Solari Soldier. All I'm trying to do is play around ways that they can kill Leona, I think. I guess they could have Targon Telstoned Leona right there, which means they don't have it. Okay, so they've got three predicts. One will probably be a small unit or a double stun. One will be a medium unit, and if they play the expensive unit, they can't play the medium unit. I think the medium and the expensive are probably mutually exclusive. So it should just be halved. I don't know why they didn't play that during... Sisters. Okay. I think that means I'm going to do... Soldier into Morning Light. I'm pretty sure. Here's Soldier. We're gonna put Morning Light on Twilight Protector. Do they have double stun? They can't afford the expensive unit. All they can afford are like genuine cards in their deck, which would just be Cosmic Youngling and the two and the one drops. Or double stun. They do have double stun. Okay. I'm going to hover this and see what the math looks like, because I don't know it in my head. It stuns one of their things. We don't know which one. Yeah, if it stuns the lifesteal unit, I win. If it doesn't steal the lifesteal unit, I'm not winning. I might still win, but I'm not winning. It's unlikely for me to be winning. Alternatively, we can silence lifesteal. They block three things. So we're only attacking with five? Okay, we can't do that. Alright. I forget which one it kills. 
Uh, I guess which one it stuns. It's gonna be the wrong one, isn't it? No, it's the right one. Okay, let's go. Whew. <laughs> okay. Now Poro King versus this deck. All right. Let's see what happens. Let's I get a point. One point is nice. I'm not going to get two points. I'm definitely only going to get one point. But one point, you know, is kind of nice, I guess. All right. You've hopefully just watched game two. It is less interesting than game one, although we're going to quickly run through it uh, slowly but surely. The Mulligan is relatively logical. Uh, I'm pretty sure we... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, okay. So there's definitely some interesting positions here. Um, I think Sunburst hits nothing outside of, like, their win cons, and I want to be pressuring them. I don't want to be outvaluing their win cons against a Cosmic Cold deck, right? Their win cons cost two mana and have Spell Shield, and Sunburst does not answer them efficiently. I think Morning Light is an insane card in Leona, especially in a deck that is trying to play for, like, a single high tempo turn. That's what Morning Light does. So I think you could have kept it, but you really also want to find Sun Guardian. Like, Sun Guardian is more important than Morning Light, as is Leona, as is Ravoon. Um, Sunhawk, I think... Look, I think Sunhawk's a really important card in general, but I I would much rather, with this hand, H, H is what I'm looking for, I'd much rather in this hand Sunhawk be either the 3-3, three, three, um, or be the 3-4, or even be the 5-5, five, five, or be Leona. And there are so many things that I want Sunhawk to be that it just isn't, that I don't think I'm... I'm supposed to keep it. I think Sunhawk makes my hands better in general, provided these become things I want. But if these remain things I don't want, I don't want Sunhawk either in those hands. That doesn't mean I should have mulliganed it away. I think you're allowed to mulligan, uh, keep Sunhawk in the mulligan because it is such a powerful combo tool for, like, it, it's better sentry, right? Especially against a deck where you don't really care about Roji's units, like, at all. Like, it's two mana sentry. That's amazing for what you want to be going for. But I I was really looking for Gwen or looking for Boy Shoso, still looking for Phantom Butler. And keeping a sentry on its own just did not seem important enough to me. This is something that I think is like going to be a staunch disagreement. Because I think many different people would keep Sunhawk here. But I, I'm not comfortable keeping Sunhawk in this position. I really want to find my big beefy units. And Sunhawk just doesn't do that for me just yet. It's one of those cards that are like extremely powerful when the rest of my hand is like... You know, I think... If you if you look at all of my possible hand states, right? Like these are these are like the bad ones, and these are like the best ones, right? Sunhawk helps out maybe from these hand states through these hand states, and is like really good. And what is cool about Sunhawk is that it gets better as this gets better, right? So like it's only marginally good here, and it's really good in the best hand states, and it's part of the best hand states. But if you've got a bad hand state, it's below average, right? So it goes like underneath the bar. The bar is this middle line here. And that's not a position I really want to keep in my mulligan. Compare this to a card like, say, Sun Guardian, which instead of having something that looks like this, uh, where, again, the blue is like... Um, or rather, where, where, where this line is just like, okay, right? And this is better than okay, and this is worse than okay. Uh, a card like the the Sun Guardian, I think, just looks like this constantly. <laughs> um, and Leona pretty much looks like this. And the 3-3 three, three looks like this. And Ravoon uh, probably looks a little bit like ri rises rises up and then goes across. But Sunhawk is very staunchly like this. And I just, I didn't want to keep a card like that just in case I am in this area as opposed to this area. That's the way I was viewing the mulligan. Maybe it's a little bit weird, but that's how I was viewing it at the time. And that's why I didn't keep Sunhawk. Okay, every other play I'm pretty sure I'm okay with, right? Like, I really like not, a, not, not playing this on one because... Uh, Unless I draw another Solari Soldier, it's not worth it. But the idea of pushing in one extra damage felt alluring to me against a deck that doesn't really have good blockers outside of Cosmic Youngling, which they end up having. I like Aggressive Twin, forcing them to use lose a Youngling. We're not defending anything with Twin. Although keep in mind that 
they do have enough for Targon, Blessing of Targon, right? Like Targon tells turns into Blessing of Targon. So this becoming a 6-4 does just trade badly into a 4-7. Uh, so maybe I shouldn't have done it because uh, if they had Targon Telstones, I would have been fucked. But I did it and it worked out for me. And I think that like, I'm sure someone like Jansport would have been yelling at my screen being like, Spitz, you're losing to Targon Telstones. How could you do this? This is not how I raised you as an LOR player, but too bad. I played it and it worked out. But also, I think you might, so you might be allowed to read into this turn and saying they don't have target on Tailstones, which is important later for the Leona turn, right? Where they don't target on Tailstones to prevent the stun. However, I I think there's worlds where Ruji doesn't even do target on Tailstones here. They're, they just like need mana desperately so they can do the Cosmic Call on 5 and try and scale back. So I don't think you can fully read into no target on Tailstones with that play. Uh, anyway, we develop the Ravusi. We develop both of these birds, which are quite nice, especially since they Nightfall and Daybreak on the second one, which gives them everything for strength. My game commentary explains the Shimon Wind Wish and the Kennen. I think it's same logic as last time, right? You're, you're just treating Kennen and Shimon Wind Wish as swarm cards as opposed to like mid-range beef, right? And you're by being swarm cards, they're either accentuating a mid-range beef by letting him hit the Nexus, or just hitting in for sideways damage while mid-range beef is getting blocked. I think that's fine. Uh I think the only other play to talk about is the play where I do Leona next turn. Or, or the turn after Leona. We've got a multitude of plays. Now, I decide to play Sunburst on this. There are a few good things that Sunburst does. One is it destroys this unit before they can get any discounts on it, as well as it is the only play that I can do besides Morning Lay um, that gives me two space worth of tempo, right? I mean, Morning Lay doesn't even do that because it only buffs my board, right? And I don't need a Daybreak Morning Lay. So this is the only thing that gives me two spaces worth of board-based tempo, which is really nice. It's a great, great position to be in when you're interacting with the board with two with something that is worthy of two actions in one action. But if they had the 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 Targon Telstone's Hush, I'm pretty sure that prevents the other stun from going off, which could be a bad thing. Now, if that occurs, that does cost four of their mana, and they are limited on mana this turn. Like, if they do that, then what else are they doing with the rest of their mana? It, it, it's sort of hard for them to justify doing a lot of things, like they can't invoke into, an, like, into a destroy or something, or they can't play sisters, right? Well, they can play sisters, but it, it costs a lot more mana out of them, right? The alternative play is to play either Dayman or this. This allows us to get a stun at burst speed because they can't interact with uh leona i don't want to play dayman because playing dayman means that with my what is it eight plus two mana with eight plus two mana i can only afford dayman plus sunburst or dayman plus uh like soldier plus this guy, and I just didn't think that was enough compared to the value that Sunburst was giving me by actually killing a unit. Because if we do Dayman and then they Sunburst or they, or they kill Leona, then I'm not able to stun excess units. And that would have been a little bit sad. I'm not Sunburst Leona, they would have done something else with Leona, the, 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 the Obliterate spell. So I like doing Sunburst, but I'm not going to claim like it's the, the safest and, and most comfortable play. When they play... Uh, I think they play... Sisters. Yeah. After they play Sisters, uh, I actually have Deterministic Lethal. If I just open and then do Blessing of Targon. Now, okay, I say Deterministic. It is not Deterministic, very technically. But uh, I, I wish there was a better position for me to see the board. Okay. Uh, ignore this guy. He doesn't exist. So they've got three blockers, right? We've got five attackers. We pull this into Leona, which means their other blockers are blocking the most, right? Let's just say they're blocking the most hypothetically. Two plus three plus blessing of Targon equals eight, which is the amount of health that's on the Nexus. They're not on Guiding Touch. So this will work uh, exceedingly well. The only way they don't die here is very specifically Moon Silver into Blessing of Targon into Hush to hush the unit, right? And if they do that, we're still killing the the lifesteal unit, and we don't have a, that bad of a turn coming up. It's not really that bad for us. Now, we obviously lose our Targon Telstones, which is one of our ways of beating the, the Overwhelm threat, right? 
but I think we could have gone for it and without knowing what the stun would be, like what, what this would end up doing for us, it might have been the better play. Now, if you can deterministically know that this will stun this, and I don't know the logic for this. I don't know if it's just because it's the first unit played, because otherwise they're equal, or if it's just completely random. Um, I know there is some sort of ordering that is consistent for spells that desire the strongest. Like if you have two spells that look for the strongest thing, uh, it will consistently name the same thing as strongest, but I don't know what, what it bases that naming off. I, I kind of think it's just a random code that's ascribed to it that's maintained throughout the game. Um, but if you know it's going to stun this, then you can go for my line and it's always good enough because they don't have, they're not going to have enough blockers outside of like... Well, they're just not going to have enough blockers. They can't do it. They can either do double stun or they can do develop two one drops or develop serpent plus two one drops, but the actions just don't make it. It I, I will win if, if this stuns the elusive unit. Uh, because these units are very, very good. Oh, sorry, stuns the life two unit. That's it. That's all for this turn. With the last game, again, we'll watch it in full, and then I'll do a review of it, but uh, that, that'll that that'll be it. See ya. Bye. Try not to die. Stick no needles in their eyes. Or King Sejuani. Alright. <laughs> Back to Fiora Pendulum. Oh, I will keep Poro stories. I'll keep Porealis. I actually kind of like Porealis. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is too slow. What do I want? How do I? How am I beating this deck? Because like I can't. There are turns where I'm not gonna be able to set up the Poro King, but I also feel like I really want to draw into it. I like Patched Poro, but I actually don't hate Fabled Poro. But I'd only like him if I had a Poro Snacks. Porealis is a tough. Like all of these are tough questions. Um, all of these cards. I'm going to cut Porealis. And I think these two are more reasonable cuts. Okay. This is an interesting hand. He has Affectionate. I'm going to play Patch Porobot. Give me Brash or Elusive or Overwhelm if you can. Oh, okay. I mean, Brash isn't fantastic. If they have the, the, the healing card, it's not the best. Okay. Maybe a better player would keep Porealis, but not me. Okay, King. Man, they love this Priestess. Holy hell. Lonely. Howdy. We might open. I would have loved if that was a Poros next man. I think I'm to do this. Developing seems kind of bad. So I'll just do it like this. Mm -hmm. They can't afford Cosmic Call, which is nice. So they should have one thing of Priestess and one thing of Scryer. I'm going to play Poros Stories, and I will play one of the Poros. We'll play this one. Quick attack, let's go. Okay, that was from Scryer. Cool. I'm happy to see that. That means they could only have gotten Obliterate from Solari Priestess. Now, they should pass here. It prevents me from playing the Poro King. Oh, fuck. If I played one of these less, then I would have been able to get the guaranteed thing off the Poro King. <sighs> That's a misplay. That's a major, major misplay. Yeah, I was trying to greet out Snacks, but that's just not... That's not That's not even viable. I really... If I had played Sinister Poro, I would have been Pogging. That's really my bad, actually. I did not think about that critically enough. Okay, thank god. Uh, they can't kill the Pirate King. I think they misplayed. I think they should have passed. Because I can't play the Pirate King, I have to pass back. Uh, here is the King of Poros. Yeah, I should be fine. Now, we've not played a Daring Poro yet, right? I mean, probably want to play Pouty Poro. Nah, Daring Poro is better. Mm -hmm. Frosted Snacks is okay. I would have preferred Pepper. Challenger Snacks would not have been bad either. Okay, are they going to kill everything that doesn't have a lot of stats? not even that bad into me, actually. 
I'll live, I think. Especially since I'll get another frosted smoke, another special snake. Double obliterate? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll start with Howdy. And then, oh, I guess we're playing both, right? Moonglow? Okay. Am I supposed to pre-commit Frosted? Surely not. Nah. I don't think so. One thing we could consider is if we want to play Buried next turn. And maybe not play the snacks. But no, I think I think if there's something we're scared of, we should Sejuani either. I think. They've not played Cosmic Call, so we're not too scared of like Living Legends nonsense. I will play at least once next. I think they're allowed to take the damage, weirdly enough. Okay. I'm gonna Frosted Snacks one of these to push more damage, I think. I think we're allowed to do Frosted Snacks. Plus we get a, we get um, Fear of the North next turn, which is actually not too bad. They're thinking, I wonder if they're thinking if they can beat Pepper Snacks or not. And if they need to block differently in order to beat Pepper Snacks. I don't I don't know what they're playing around. I'm very curious. I can't wait to watch what his what his thoughts are. Why is yeah, okay, I, like I think you're supposed to block Batty Pyro. Ooh. This is him playing around Pepper Snacks. I betcha. Yeah. Uh We are gonna hurt this. Are we? Do we do this? No, I think we're supposed to do this. Okay, let's see what they go for. Can they afford Cosmic Call? If they afford Cosmic Call, they shouldn't be able to play too, too much. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. Pyro Snacks. Who up snacking on the Poro? Wait, no, don't do that. That's not... Don't do that, please. Poro is a friend, not food. Alright, age-old question. Sejuani now or Sejuani later? Like, if we Sejuani next turn, what's the punish? A Pluri Obliterate does not bother me. We could also do Harsh Winds Buried, but I don't think we can do Buried plus uh, Poro Snacks. If we do Sejuani... I think we're just supposed to Sejuani next turn and pull three three sisters then. Okay. So from start tip to peak, they got Moonglow and Charger. They played Supernova and they played Golden Sisters. But there's also the Priestess, and this was from Mountain Scry. So the Priestess... We've still not seen one thing the Priestess has given. But I think that's okay. As far as I can tell, we're supposed to play Sejuani next turn. To pull her to the side. As far as I can tell, that's the right play, I think. So as far as I can tell, we're passing. Duskbringer. Okay, as far as I can tell, we're still passing. Well, I mean, we can do Fury the North, right? Like, to what extent are we just supposed to have three Overwhelms, Poros next, and Fury the North? How much mana do we have next turn? We've got eight plus three. We do this, we'll have eight plus one. Which is Fury the North plus Harsh Winds, or Harsh Winds plus Poros next. All right, let's Sejuani now. I don't know if I like this line more, but it's what I'm going to do. Uh, this is going to be another one we have to think a lot. But I think our damage is high enough. Another Sejuani? Holy shit, okay. 
Um, we start with... I think we start with you, then you, then you, then you, then you, then you. Okay, let's see what happens. We got Snacks, we got Sejuani's Fury the North. They all they could have are Targon Tailstones. That's the only piece of interaction they can have outside of maybe Pale Cascade. So we're gonna start with Poro Snacks almost certainly. Well Poro Snacks only pushes two more damage in, right? Do we start with Harsh Winds? Harsh Winds prevents four damage. Well, let's start with Harsh Winds. Then they tag on Tailstones something. Oh, Star Shaping. Fuck, I actually forgot about Star Shaping. Okay. That could actually be really bad if we needed the three sisters to beat stuff. Yeah, and Fury of the North's not going to be enough anymore. Uh-oh. I might have lost. I forgot. I completely forgot about Star Shaping. Interesting. What are they thinking about? Are they thinking about doing Targon Telstones to protect one of these units? Like, protect this guy? If so, I think I'm willing to Fury the North. Yeah, okay. Blessing of Targon. Okay, I'm gonna Fury the North. Just making sure we're not missing lethal by doing this. Hopefully means they're gonna have not enough mana to play stuff. And we can still play Buried. Which doesn't seem too bad to me. Okay. All they should have is a Star Shaping card and a... Oh my god, okay. And a card from Sisters. I'm hoping they took deal kill everything with three or less strength. That would be good for me. I, think. I don't even need Porous next to beat that with double fury. Then I'll... Priestess. Okay, I'm not gonna play buried yet. If they play sisters, I might play buried. Okay, I'm gonna do buried now. I got Fury. I got Fury the North. Who up? Northing the Fury. Hold on. Let's get the level up for for the for the for the for the pink ghost statistics. Hell yeah! Sejuani level up. Take that fucking pink ghost. Get your stats. Cosmic cold deck doesn't bring. Oh, did I send my GG? Please tell me I sent my GG. Okay, good. Thank you. Well played, Reggie. Well. Hmm. Good attempt on your invex, I guess, is maybe slightly more accurate. What a stressful week. Okay. Cool. Time to end the recording. Alright, you're probably looking at this mulligan and you've probably got an opinion. I don't know what the right opinion is for this mulligan. I, I could not tell you. I think that Patch Porobot is very, very good. So I don't hate keeping it. Uh, but these cards, I uh, you could write like theses on all of these. I think Fabled Poro is the most obvious of a kick. It just doesn't give you enough tempo without a Poro snacks, and you just can't justify it. Typically, it's very good as a one of when you actually have an established board. But before an established board, it's just not good. I never ever kept Poro stories in pretty much any hand uh, until Jan Sports once mentioned that maybe I should actually be doing this, and then like Monty was in the call and was like, "Yeah, you should." And I had no clue. I'd never get Poro Stories before, so I don't know. I, I don't know what to do with Poro Stories. Maybe if you have an opinion. And Porealis is just like an insane card that I cannot 
tell you if I should be keeping it or not. If you have an opinion, genuinely let me know because I do not know how to mulligan for the Poro King deck outside of keep King, keep Poro Sled, keep Lonely Poro, not Sled, sorry, uh, the, the old man, uh, Poro Herder and Lonely Poro and maybe some like matchup dependent obvious tools like freezes into decks that loses to freeze or whatever, yeah. I cannot tell you what the right mulligan is, so tell me what you think it is, because I, I don't know. I liked the mulligan that I went with, but this is a major uncertainty point for me, and I have heard many good things about keeping Poro stories. It's just something that I have not done, personally speaking. Other than that, a lot of the early turns I think are very good and justified. We don't have to go through them too deeply outside of not playing the Poro. I don't know why I was going to say let's play one Poro. Playing one Poro just felt right. It was like, you know what? The right amount of Poros to play is just one. I, I could not tell you why. Clearly, getting the special snacks and being able to get the special snacks instantly next turn... Um, like by playing a regular Poro without having to spend three mana on a regular snacks, but instead of spending two mana on a special snacks, it's just like, it is so much better. I'm so used to keeping Poro King at five out of six, so you can double up on snacks, right? So you play Poro King on five, and then you get a regular snacks, a special snacks, and a second special snacks by doing like the, the level up thing, you know, that you can do with Sejuani and so far. Uh, with the Poro King. I am so used to doing that. But I thought, obviously, let's just do that. But, like, this is not how to play the video game against a deck that has single target slow speed removal. Like, Grand Prix Roji's deck. So, I wish I just played a Poro and then done the Poro King and then done... Got on my special snacks and then played another Poro and got on a second special snacks. Like, imagine if I actually had Pepper snacks. I would have won, right? Or, or maybe not won, but I would have been in such a fucking amazing position. Or Espresso snacks. Oh, just like, man, oh man, I wish I'd played the parking. We still end up winning, so it's not like the worst thing in the world, but like, it is such an insane misplay. Uh, every turn from around here, I think is fine. I think the Frosted Snacks is pretty justifiable. We don't need to go through these too deeply. I think all of this is fine. I think you could make different decisions about like Buried and Ice and Freezes and Sejuani, but I don't hate my decision. Uh, I will say, when we inevitably do decide to Sejuani, I think I, I mind fled myself into killing the, the or freezing the lifesteal. Uh, they can't attack with lifesteal, because I'll just block with Sejuani. Like, they're not actually allowed to attack with this. The only unit they're allowed to attack with with this one is so in, so in freeze. Jesus Christ, my words. I am thoroughly tired. It is past the night of mid. Uh, I should have frozen the elusive sister for... It's the only one that can actually attack me. Everything else isn't able to attack me because they died to Sejuani. So I should have uh, Sedge frozen the, the Silver Sister over the Sejuani freeze on the Golden Sister. That's about it. I actually don't think there's that much to analyze in this game, and I think my in-game commentary is pretty astute. Uh, obviously, I didn't realize like they could play Star Shipping at this time, but that's not too big of a concern. We're able to win. You could argue that playing Harsh wins as opposed to... Uh, this ahead of time was maybe a little bit bad of a line, and I should have started with uh, Fury then after Threaten Lethal and then do Harsh Winds afterwards. I think that's probably better knowing ahead of time that they're on the the Star Shaping, right? Like, or knowing that Star Shaping is a possible answer for an open attack when all I was thinking of was Targon Tailstones. I guess Targon Tailstones, you don't really want to start be starting with, uh, with Fury then off, but so be it. Uh, that's... Pretty much all, you know, I don't have to play Harsh Winds, but you can work that out by the in-game commentary. So I don't think there's actually too much to analyze with this game. To be honest, I think I just play it sufficiently and it pogs out and video games have been won. So instead of talking about that, I want to leave you with some final things. Um, one, if you're liking Spid's YouTube VOD reviews, I, 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 I cannot put into words how much I recommend the Cephalopod VOD reviews, especially for this week in particular. He has a way of describing his prep that as soon as he said it, it clicked really, really, really well. And it's, I think it's really fascinating to go through it. Seth's video quality may not be the best. Uh, it's very Cephalopodian and sort of campy and kind of cute. Um, that he, like, he's got his background being all fuzzy and his audio pops in and out and he's doing the slideshow, except his slideshow is way more zoomer and graphic than mine, which is very, like, stock standard. Um, but the way he explains his prep is, like, thoroughly worth watching. And there's also one decision that he makes in his second game against Sir Termond that I... 
I am enamored with. It is a very interesting explanation where he goes over what spells the enemy gamer could have played and what hand reader lets him have. Uh, I think, like, if you're liking Speed YouTube, Cephalopod does what I do, except better and more concise, right? I don't think you're allowed to watch Cephalopod just via audio, um, or it won't be as effective. Well, I think you're allowed to watch at least the, the, the slideshow bits with just audio, which is nice um, for what I do. But I really recommend watching the Cephalopod stuff. It's, it's good. It's good. Um, that's about it. Thanks for watching. I know this one was a little bit longer, but I wanted to have the full game because I think the in-game commentary is rather valuable for this one. It's not something I'm willing, I'm going to be forcing myself to keep. I think like the, the multiple formats that I've got, like just scrubbing through the games and talking about it or watching the games live and talking about it or having the games watch and then do a talk afterwards. I think all three formats have their time. And I think this is a good time to use the, to watch the games in full and then talk about them afterwards. Uh, that's all. Next week we'll be fighting Cephalopod, who is definitely going to be scary, and I don't know what I'm going to do against him. Uh, that should be all. Uh, we have gone... Uh, I guess we could talk about like the standings, I guess. Uh, we are 3-in-1. There are three other players who are 3-in-1, so there are four 3-in-1s. There are two 2-in-2s, two and there are four 1-in-3s. Slay actually won. Let's go. Uh, good job, Slay. Um... And currently we got the most points tied with Jason Sechenal. And I'm excited for next week, because if we win, then there's a good chance that we'll be pogging at the top and no one will be able to contest us. And if we don't win, that won't be great. But that's all. See you some other time. Goodbye. <laughs>